Today's presentation is the development and implementation of a dynamic warm-up. Our presenter is Steve Murray, and he is the fitness director and head strength coach and conditioning coach at McAllister College in Minnesota. Steve is in his sixth year as the head coach and um, for all 21 sports at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, including the men's and women's soccer programs. He designs and implements the strength, speed, agility, and quickness programs for all varsity athletes. He has over 13 years of experience in the field of strength and conditioning and is certified through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. He attended the University of Minnesota where he played football and graduated with a degree in sports management and earned his Masters of Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin. Welcome, Steve, to the presentation. Thank you, Dave. Um, today, uh, the goal of this webinar uh, is really to just give you a background and insight on how to put together a, a proper dynamic warm-up for soccer. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the science behind it, um, as I want to leave time to give you practical uh, information that you can um, uh, that you can take away from this and, and implement right away. Um, I do think it is important, though, that you, to kind of explain what a dynamic warm-up is. Um, and obviously, it, it stayed on the slide, but um, really, dynamic warm-up, the main piece of it is it's moving the body through um, ranges of motion. Um, and it's active range of motion. Um, in, uh, you know, obviously, just like any other warm-up, uh, you're going to increase the heart rate, which is going to increase the body temperature and blood flow. So um, you're accomplishing the stuff of a regular warm-up, but we're also getting that body ready for uh, the demands of either playing a game um, or practice. Um, for us at McAllister, uh, with what we do with our dynamic warm-ups with men's and women's soccer, um, to us it's a lot more than just a warm-up. Um, you know, we really want to spend time on the injury prevention, um, make sure we're maximizing their performance, um, and also working on proper mechanics. And when looking at these types of things, uh, the one thing we kept coming back to when you look at injury prevention programs when we've met with um, different physicians or with our athletic training staff um, is repetition. Um, and, you know, with, with, as a strength coach, with us only uh, getting them one, one to three times a week uh, in the weight room, we needed to find a way where we could get the repetition done every day on some of these injury prevention exercises on, you know, the doing proper mechanics uh, um, for landing or, or for jumping or change of direction. Um, and so we saw that our warm-up is an opportunity to do this. Um, so... <clears throat> When we do our warm-up, we want to make sure that we're incorporating exercises that work on stability, um, work on proprioception, on the activation, on the strength and technique. Um, and so for us, in order to accomplish a, you know, a good dynamic warm-up um, and, and accomplish these other things that we, we feel we want to get out of the warm-up, uh, we want to work on these goals. Um, uh, Apologize real quick, the slide didn't change on me. Um, so we want to accomplish these goals of, of a general warm-up, um, working the body through the different ranges of motion, um, working on stability in the exercise that we choose, uh, the activation, the strength, and technique. Um, now, uh, as far as how you go through this, um, you know, the general warm-up needs to come first to get the, get the body ready to go, but as far as incorporating exercises with the range of motion stability, it's kind of up to you on what's going to work best um, for your program and, and, and how you want to put together your warm-up. Um, as we go through these uh, different goals, uh, I didn't include uh, videos on how to uh, go through them, um, so if there is stuff that you're not uh, sure on what I'm uh, talking about the exercise, you will, after the presentation, be given a link to our website um, where we have uh, videos of all the different uh, exercises that we incorporate into our dynamic warm-up. Um, you also have a link that actually shows you uh, the dynamic warm-up that we used this past fall. Um, now, we're always uh, changing things and adjusting to what we feel is best. Um, so what we do next year um, will be similar, but there will be some changes uh, to it as we get into the season. Um, when you're looking at you know, the general warm-up, um, I see the most important piece is just getting them warmed up. You know, just like any warm up, we want to get the um, get them moving. And so, um, for us, um, when we start our general warm up, 
you know, we start right into just doing basic movements in the different planes that they're going to be uh, using when they're playing the sport of soccer. Um, if you have more time, um, you may start with a five-minute jog or you know, a two-mile two run or, you know, coaches have different ways of wanting to get them warmed up in the start. Um, you know, and that's kind of dictated by how much time you have, um, how much volume you want to put on their legs. If you're going to be doing a lot of running in practice or conditioning at the end, uh, then you're going to want to probably want to limit the volume you're putting on their legs uh, when you're getting started. Um, and so for us, um, you know, our athletes are out there uh, prior to practice starting, kicking the ball around, doing general movements. So they're, they're kind of already starting into their warm-up. Um, so when we start the actual dynamic warm-up, uh, we don't start with a five-minute jog or, or uh, um, any type of run like that. We get right into our movement. So, um, you know, we'll do a forward movement, uh, some type of running movement where we'll incorporate arm movement so that they have to stabilize through the core and the hips. Because um, a lot of times when you start moving your arms, your legs like to do the same thing. So if you're running with arms across the chest, then they really got to focus on letting their, keeping their knees straight ahead, which, again, will engage those hips and the core. Um, and then we'll get into our lateral movement, you know, a shuffle or a karaoke, um, get them into some back pedaling, um, and then some different cuts. Um, and, again, this is a general warm-up. So when they're going through this, all this is sub-maximum level. So when they're cutting, it's, it's just real slow working on uh, um, the technique of it and just getting their body loose ready to go. Um, and then when you start looking at range of motion, um, obviously once you get down to general warm-up, then again, however you want to uh, work in your exercises, um, but our next goal is to work on the range of motion. This is really kind of the main piece of a dynamic warm-up as we talk about moving the body through active range of motion. Um, just like the general warm-up, we want to start easy um, and increase. So um, this starting easy and increasing can be in two different ways. Uh, the first way in starting easy is your choice of exercise. Um, and so, you know, starting with a uh, basic exercise, like we start with a Frankenstein walk where they're just walking with their hands straight on front and they're kicking their uh, toe up towards their hand and they're just stepping forward. We'll start something more simple with that and then we'll start adding more complex stuff where they're going from one, transitioning from one exercise to the next, um, like a lunge into a single leg RDL. Um, so we'll start basic on the exercise and then progress through as we get into the dynamic warm-up. Um, but the other piece is also starting easy in the range of motion they're using. So when they first start that Frankenstein uh, walk, their first step as they kick up isn't going to be a, a huge step trying to kick as high as they can because we're just starting the warm-up. We don't want uh, them to start with a pulled hamstring. So, um, you know, I always tell our athletes when we're starting the warm-up, you know, work with soccer is, you know, whatever that natural movement allows, okay? So if it's only halfway up, then that's what it is. And each step, you know, try letting it increase a little bit, but never force the movement or never make it uh, jerky. Um, and uh, this is a dynamic warm-up. So when we choose our exercises, again, it's, it's exercises that they're moving through that range of motion. Um, at no point will we um, add in a, a static stretch um, where um, they're holding it for five or ten seconds. Uh, we want to keep them moving. Um, something I uh, left out in the first slide is when we're looking at this, you know, moving them through ranges of motion. Um, the reason we've moved towards that instead of the static stretching is there's a lot of research out recently that shows static st stretching prior to um, an explosive movement, you know, in practice or a game, it actually limits your ability. So static stretching should really be done on the, on the, um, on the back end of a practice after a performance, um, whereas that dynamic movement um, is actually aids in the in the performance and um, is going to help be more beneficial to them for a practice or for a game. Um, so, um, and then after after the goal after the goal of range of motion, then we start getting into stability. And stability for us is just making sure we're consciously incorporating it into the exercises that we choose for our other goals that we're using. Um, so, for example, that Frankenstein walk that we do where they're walking forward and they're kicking their hand up to, or their foot up to their hand, um, what we're going to do is we're going to coach them up that when they, they're balancing on one leg as they kick the other leg up. Now when they bring that leg down, we want them to go right into that next step so that they're always only on one leg and they're having to stabilize in that one leg instead of kicking it up and then taking two or three small steps and then kicking it up again. Um, we don't want them to have that time to readjust. We want them to have to work on st stabilizing on that one leg as they go. And we'll talk, focus on making sure they're on the ball of their foot, not standing flat-footed 
as they're balancing on that one leg. Um, and then, you know, difficulty of exercise as far as, the, and I talked in the last slide about transitioning from, um, you know, a lunge into a single leg RDL. Well, again, we're working on stability on that one leg. So they step out in the lunge and then that front leg, they have to balance on that front leg as they go into a single leg RDL, which single leg RDL, they're balancing on that one leg, kicking the other leg off, up and extend pushing their hip back and kind of forming a T with their body. So they have their base and then they're from their heel to the uh, to their head on that top leg is, is like the top of a T. And so again, we're incorporating that stability into the movement. Um, besides our range of motion exercises, you know, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about, you know, the, us working on technique of landing or activation in our jumps. Again, we'll incorporate stability in that, whether we're having them land on a single leg or we're incorporating line hops. Um, again, where they're on one leg, having to jump back and forth and have to work on the stability of the ankle, knee, and the hip. Um, thing with the stability, and, and I'll probably say this several times in the in the slides, is um, you know, start easy and build up, and also just know the level of athlete you have. Um, some of the exercises that we have in our dynamic warm up that we do for stability are going to be too high of a level for um, an athlete that just you know is is um, seven eight years old. Um, or, or someone that hasn't done those exercises before and they're even a little older. Um, so start simple, simple, and you know stability in the start may be just between your um, dynamic movements, you're having them balance on one foot for 10 seconds, and then they go into their next movement. And then once they get down where they're able to stabilize on one leg without wiggling and moving all over the place, then add uh, moving forward and having to go from a movement into a, a stability position. Um, and then build up from there. Um, so incorporating stability into all the, you know, into the different exercises and, um, you know, working up in levels and starting simple, incorporating, you know, one exercise maybe at a, at a time and then maybe, you know, as you move, progress in a couple of weeks, make two or three of the exercises you do have stability in them. Um, but, you know, accomplishing that, that goal of, of having them have to balance on one leg, um, either in place or in a movement. Um, and then from the stability piece, um, our next goal is we, we're trying to work on activation. And, you know, and another, you know, piece in the, uh, with our dynamic warm-up, you know, and accomplishing all these goals, it all started with us sitting down with our athletic training staff and figuring out a way that we could cut back on the injuries that we're having with our soccer players. And we're just having too many uh, lower joint uh, injuries, um, and, we, you know, we wanted to find a way to, to get those cut back. And, um, so when we look at the activation piece, that was a, one of the big reasons we brought it into the dynamic warm-up is when we start looking at, uh, you know, injury prevention for, for knee injuries is, is activating your abductors, your glutes. Um, so, you know, we started with that. And so we added in bridges. Um, and the bridge now is you're laying on your back, you know, uh, knees bent, heels on the ground, pushing your hips up. And so we started just with basic bridges just to work on the activation of the glutes. Um, and then we started adding in bands. Um, you know, and bands are a real easy way to uh, to work on some uh, um, you know activation with the abductors. You can buy bands online for two or three dollars. They're they're smaller bands that you either put around their knees or their ankles, and you do you know movements where they're stepping out or stop, stepping straight ahead, but having to push against the band and keep their knees from uh, coming in. Um, but we started adding in those activation exercises um, for our abductors and. You know, and later on I'll talk about putting it together, but it's just piecing together where you put those. Because obviously it's a, it's a dynamic warm-up and we want to keep them moving. So when you do have some of these exercises where they're standing still or, or laying on the ground, it's, you know, important not to um, put a bunch of those together and, and split them up. Um, but then we'll also do ad, um, activation for our ankles, whether it be toe raises or, or line hops. Um, so we'll, we'll work on activation exercises uh, mainly in our glutes and our abductors. Um, and then also in our ankles. Um, but then the other piece of activation that a lot of times gets forgotten is you look at activate, activation is trying to get a, a muscle firing, but activation is also getting a, a muscle firing at a higher rate. I mean, part of the reason of the dynamic warm-up is to get them to perform at their potential for that practice or for that game. Um, and so the first time they sprint out on the uh, soccer field, you don't want them, or the first time they sprint, you don't want to be on the soccer field where they haven't warmed up at all. Um, so We'll do activation exercises of power skips or, you know, explosive movements where we build into them and, and get them firing at a higher level. We'll do accelerations where, 
you know, they'll start in a walk, and then they'll get into a jog, into a run on the first rep. Then the next rep, they'll finish a, a little higher up on their top end. Um, and then finally, after like the fourth rep, we'll finish with a sprint, or the fifth rep, where they, that top end of it's a, a full-out sprint. That way, you know, when they get onto the field, when they want to sprint, they're firing at a higher level and hopefully are running faster than they would have if they didn't. Um, and then they're also hopefully hope working on some injury prevention um, with getting them warmed up properly to perform those explosive exercises. Um, and then, you know, the other goal is uh, um, is strength. Now, um, strength, it varies on, on, you know, the level of athlete and, and, and what they're doing outside of, of playing the sport of soccer. Um, for us, strength isn't a huge, huge component um, because we get them, you know, one to three times a week in the weight room. In season, they're in there twice. Out of season, they're in there three times. And, you know, on certain weeks where we have uh, um, uh, multiple games, we're only in once. Um, but we accomplish our strength in the, in the weight room. But for an athlete who doesn't have access to a weight room or a young athlete who's um, just beginning out, uh, beginning in strength training or hasn't even gotten to using strength training yet, um, the dy dynamic warm-up is a great way to introduce them to it. Um, you know, first teaching them the proper way to do exercises, incorporating body weight squats, where they're just you know standing in place, you know working on the proper technique, getting into a full squat, coming out and doing just a set of ten as part of the dynamic warm up. Uh, we get a lot of our first year soccer players come in that um, we can't even put a weight on their on their back for squatting for like first two two months during the season because we're having to teach them how to do a proper squat, whereas if you know starting at age 10, 11, they were doing body weight squats and working on their, putting their body through that proper range of motion, then they can take more advantage of the strength exercises down the road. Um, same with lunges or single leg RDLs, those type of exercises, getting them that base so they can utilize it when they do get to a, a, a position where they can use the weight room. Um, but there is a component of strength to it. If, if an athlete hasn't, soccer player hasn't, you know, done any strength training, body weight squats is going to provide them a basic level of strength. You know, lunges, single leg RDLs, those exercises are going to uh, give them, you know, a basic level of strength. Um, and another one that uh, we like to use, especially in season, where if we're not getting in the weight room enough, is we'll do partner hamstrings. Um, with soccer, uh, there's always a lot of uh, in injuries due to imbalance between the quad and the hamstring. Um, and so, you know, doing exercises where we can strengthen that hamstring um, is going to help with those injury prevention. So we'll do a partner hamstring. We'll do it a couple different ways. We'll, one, we'll have the athlete lay on the ground on their stomach and then a partner with their knees bent, heels towards the ceiling, uh, sky, and then the partner will pull down on the heels and um, the, the person laying on their stomach is, is resisting them pulling it down. We'll work both down and up. We'll also do one where we do a hamstring drop where they kneel down and the partner puts their hands on the ankles and holds them down is that um, person who's kneeling slowly controls their torso until it gets to the ground. Um, now, depending on their strength level, it may be for a half a second before they lose control and they just flop to the ground and then they push themselves up. And for you know a higher level athlete, they may be able to get halfway down or even further. Um, but you know, it's a the dynamic warm is a great way to incorporate strength for those athletes that are not getting in the weight room or for those that are um, uh, uh, learning how to you know properly do exercise that eventually they're going to utilize once they uh, start their strength program. Um, then the last goal um, is the technique. Um, and again, this this piece, the technique piece, um, obviously we want to improve their performance. But for us, the technique piece was another uh, huge component in our injury prevention. Um, when we looked at uh, research out there and, and our, our beliefs on how to uh, how to prevent injuries, we saw that this is a, a way to, uh, um, to do that. Uh, a lot of you know, as far as when they land, we want them to land uh, when they jump and they land or they change direction and they're stopping their body. We want them to always land with their hips back. So we want their hips in a loaded position. We want them on the balls of the feet. Uh, well, we're finding out a lot of our athletes when they're landing, their knees are shifting forward um, or their knees were collapsing in on them. Uh, a lot of the issues that lead to injuries we were seeing in, in the landing technique of, of our soccer players. Um, so we started incorporating it into our dynamic warm-up. Um, so we use this towards the end of our warm-up, and we'll do basic jumps where they have to land, and, and for a three-count, hold the position, whether it's jumping into double leg or onto single leg. 
We'll do it on vertical jumps, on forward jumps, on lateral jumps. Um, so we'll take and then we'll do it running, have them run and then stop in a hold, uh, run and change direction and stop. So we'll create a lot of different movements and have to make them have to handle that force and the proper technique. Um, now it's a warm up, so we're not having them do a maximum jump. Um, so we're not worried about them being too fatigued after doing this because it's all submaximum jumping and really just working on the form of, of how to land or how to stop yourself or how to push off to change direction. Um, and you know, in the um, three years that we've used utilized the technique in our dynamic warm up, we've really seen a lot of improvement on um, on how they are landing or how they are changing their direction and. You know, there's a lot of things that contributed, but we've also seen a, a, a fairly big reduction in the injuries that we are having. Um, and also, you know, some coaches want to utilize this time to work on speed. So, you know, if you want to incorporate speed techniques, um, this would be a place to utilize it. We don't have enough time in this dynamic warm-up to utilize uh, it, the speed technique, so we don't include it into our uh, into our technique. Um, so then, once you have these different goals, I just went over. It's obviously how do you put it together. Um, and when you're looking at putting it together, you know the first thing is the teaching and the uh, reinforcing it. And uh, to me, when you're looking at the teaching piece, is uh, is again, and, and I've said this a few times, is starting basic, uh, making sure that um, they know how to do the exercise correctly that you're putting in there. Start with just a few and make sure they do those right before you add more. Um, be a really be realistic with the time you have. If you have 10 minutes, don't put 15 minutes worth of exercise in there where you're just rushing through it and not taking the time to teach them how to do it correctly. Um, and don't make the dynamic warm-up more than it is. Um, a lot of times coaches want to start adding in soccer-specific movements uh, or drills with a, with a soccer ball, and also now um, the, the athlete kind of loses uh, track on what they're really trying to work on. So you know, w wait until after the dynamic warm-up to incorporate those different uh, type of drills you want to have. Um, and then the final piece to me is coach. Coach them through the dynamic warm-up. Don't use it as a time for you to get ready for practice or to meet with your coaching staff. Obviously, if that's the only, way, only time you have and you have to do it that way, then you do. But do your best to try being active in their dynamic warm-up and coaching them up on how to do things correctly so they're getting the most out of it. They're also going to see how important it is to you that they're doing this. And it's a great way to evaluate your, uh, your athletes and see where they're at. You know, if, you're, if you have an athlete that can't balance on one leg for two or three seconds in a movement, um, and that's someone you maybe need to give a little more time uh, to or to give them additional stuff that they can uh, work on. Um, and then as far as your order and time, uh, again, start with the general warm-up. Make sure you're ending with your most complex or explosive exercises after they're warmed up. Um, and then uh, work on having it you know, build up so that you're ending with an elevated heart rate and, and you're transitioning right into practice. Um, you know, and that's part of the time pieces. Um, you know, if you know with your practice that you're going to have the first part of practice standing around, whether it's coaching something up or or just talking with them, do that first. Then go through your dynamic warm up. Don't just jump, don't just do your dynamic warm up, then have them stand around for 10 minutes because you're kind of negating what you're trying to accomplish in your dynamic warm up. Um, the other piece is, and I, and I kind of talked about in the last slide is, you know, create a dynamic warm up that fits the time you have, so they're not rushed through it and they're and they're doing it right. Um, you know, and a good dynamic warm-up can range from anywhere from 7 to 15 minutes. Kind of depends on, you know, how much you really want to put in there and how much time you're willing to take out of practice for it. Um, our dynamic warm-up, once they get it down with the first years and everything, takes about 9 minutes. Um, and then, you know, the final, the final slide is the situ know the situation. Um, know the level of athlete you have as far as the exercises you're choosing um, and how many you're choosing and how you're going about uh, coaching it. Know their conditioning level. Um, our dynamic warm-up at the pace we go through it and how we do it, um, if an athlete's not in shape, um, they can't get through it all. They're too tired. And so knowing their level and not putting in too much or not going through too fast a pace, for now it's actually making their performance worse because they're tired going into practice. Um, another thing is the temperature. You know, if it's a really hot day out, you're going to want to shorten that, uh, of that dynamic warm-up because um, we don't want their uh, body temperature to get too elevated and, and get them into fatigue prior to practice or prior to a game. Um, when you're looking at a game uh, situation, if you have multiple games in a, in a day or in a weekend, you know, incorporating a lot of jumping into your dynamic warm-up in every, in every one is going to be too much on their legs. 
So or the volume of, of how much running you do in it is making sure you adjust that warm up. And if you have two games in one day or, or a couple in a weekend is, you know, um, doing a, a, a modified warm up that you're not going to be taxing them too much. Um, and then the other piece is how long are they active? Um, when you look at a, a game, if you have your whole team do a dynamic warm up prior to the, the start of the game, and then you have some of the players that don't get in until um, late into the first half or into the second half, you know, they should be on the sideline doing a modified dynamic warm-up on their own to get them ready to go. Because a dynamic warm-up and then standing around for 40 minutes or 30 minutes, they need to redo it. So, um, you know, if you're, uh, soccer's nice because some sports like a basketball, you can't really do a dynamic warm-up right next to your chairs. But on the soccer field, there's usually space on the side. And, they, you know, if you can give your athlete four or five minutes to, you know, notification um, to get the warm-up in before they go in, that's great. I see it doesn't always work that way, uh, but when you can, um, you know, try accomplishing that. Um, so right now I'm going to turn it back over to Dave for any questions. Thanks, Steve. And uh, let me, before we do get to questions, let me just um, remind you that if you have a question on anything we've gone through today, please send those in using your chat function on your attendees control panel. As a participant in this series, you can also receive a Play Like Manchester United booklet that includes nine activities um, used by their training staff, and that will be sent to you as a matter of course uh, by participating in this session. Um, we'll also be sending out an email tomorrow or um, maybe later today, but most likely tomorrow, they'll have a link to the video recording and also links to um, Steve's email address and the websites he's mentioned. So um, those will be coming out, the URLs, so you can go on and actually see some video of some of the activities. So Steve, um, as I um, transition into the questions, I had a question for you. Um, you talked about the transition from the dynamic warm-up into training and the game. Um, traditionally, you see that uh, players go back in the dress room, certainly at a high level, they go back in the dress room, they have another team talk, and then they come out five, ten minutes later. Um, is, is that something that you see changing, or is that just going to be part and parcel of most sports? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see that's something that's changing, because I've, I've talked with our coaches about it, too, and, uh, you know, there's, and there's certain things as, as, far as, as far as a sport that, you know, there's ideal, and then there's realistic. Um, and um, it's trying to bring those two together in, in, in whatever way we can and, 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 and get it done. And, you know, it may be doing a couple additional things after they come back out. And, and in, in some ways, athletes already do it, it's, and it's not even consciously. But it, you notice a lot of times when uh, in, after, a, uh, a, you know, they come out of the locker room right before they start, the, those players that are usually uh, uh, on the field ready to start, they'll do a couple jumps where they drive their knee up, knees up, or they'll do some quick buck kicks or, or you know, they'll uh, uh, do short sprints. So a lot of it kind of takes care of itself a little bit with the athletes, and it's more just keeping an eye on it. And if you see a, see one of the players that comes out and they're just standing around before the start is just maybe um, giving them some suggestions or just making them aware that, you know, you, we've just been sitting for 10 minutes, you know, you might want to do couple uh, basic movements before you get into actual play. Thanks. Um, so let's go to some of the questions, um, we, and we've got a lot coming in. Um, Ch Charlie, uh, amongst others, has asked about the age that we should be starting the dynamic warm-ups and stretching. Um, well, to me, it's is, is <laughs> as young as we can. Um, I think the younger the athlete, the um, the quicker that they can adapt and, and, and get their body to do what we're asking. And the later we, when, that, when I get them at age 18, 19, it takes so many more repetitions to get them to do it right. Um, now, the thing I learned uh, a few years back when I, um, I did a youth soccer camp and did some, some basic strength stuff with them was, was an eye-opener to me as far as, you know, how patient you have to be and how more basic you have to be. And so I understand at the youngest level, doing a lot of the exercises we do, it's one, it's they're not ready for it, but uh, two, just keeping them uh, focused and being able to get them to do it right is, is not the easiest thing to accomplish. Um, so to me, yeah, start them at the earliest age as you can, but keep it simple. It may be just choosing three three things that you want them to work on 
um, and then you know maybe by the end of the year you build it up to to five exercises. Um, but I think you know as far as like do they at that young age do they need the full dynamic warm up to keep them injury free and stuff? I don't think they need a full dynamic warm up. I don't know the science behind it, so it's that's more my opinion. But I do think at the the younger the age we can get them started into the mindset of this is how you get ready for your sport. Um, then that'll carry through and it'll be easier for the as they get older for them to be able to do the exercises that are more complex and to get the, get out of what they need. Um, we still have, you know, with, in, with our soccer team where they go play on their own and they don't warm up and then all of a sudden the next day I have a, one of them coming down saying I pulled my hamstring. Well, did, what did you do for your warm up? Oh, well, we just went into playing. So uh, to me, you know, if we can get them that mindset that this is how the, they always warm up, then even when they're not with us, they're at least doing some stuff to get themselves ready for uh, um, for playing or for competition. So um, great, uh, Christine asked a question: um, How um, young should a dynamic warm up um, becoming part of a every uh, every soccer session? Um, which I think you've uh, answered. But part B of her question is: Is it critical for a ten-year-old girls team to ensure that they go through a dynamic warm up before kicking the ball? Um, you know, uh, I've seen, and this is more anecdotal, but I, I've seen a lot more uh, ACL tears at younger ages in, uh, in girls. Um, and to us, you know, we had, um, I don't like to admit it, but it, uh, four years ago we had four, C, four ACL tears in one season with our women's soccer team, which that's what really initiated this warm-up. And the big thing is, like, the proper landing technique and the mechanics of pushing the butt back and, and sitting down and so especially with the female athletes the younger age we can get them doing those proper techniques of how to land um, is going to be crucial in trying to you know cut down on those ACL injuries or other injuries that happen uh, in the lower limbs so to me yeah I if if I was a soccer coach and I was um, working with 10 year old uh, girls I would definitely be starting to work on some of those basic movements of the dynamic warm-up of having them be able to control their body about you know on one leg or you know working on that basic strength of lunges and um, um, you know uh, RDLs for the hamstrings and things like that um, I definitely don't think tens too young of an age and um, you know especially for the type of exercises that you would be starting them with um, there's definitely no chance of injury and you know I I'd, since there's no chance of injuries I'd rather take the take the time to do it on the chance that it is helping them. Um, David actually asked a follow-up question to that and asked about the differences between boys and girls and are there specific exercises you do with boys um, than girls and vice versa? Yeah, um, there are some differences, um, uh, but to me I, I train them the same in the fact that um, I, I have our men do what the women do because I don't want to take the risk because there are there are some men that are going to have some of, some of the, the same stuff that uh, imbalances that you would see in a woman uh, or in a girl and so I want our men to do it too because I don't want them to have a chance of injury so yeah there's there's definitely stuff that we we do with our female athletes um, because of the differences uh, between our men and women but we have our men do them too just to be on the safe side and we're in a situation where we have the time where we can spend it on that um, but you know uh, as as girls get older the um, the the difference between the quad and the hamstring that that imbalance increases, and so it's important uh, with with our females or girls, uh, women or girls, that we're doing more hamstring work with them. And so, you know, definitely getting them started on doing like those partner hamstring drops um, or our um, uh, par uh, the partner hamstrings where they're laying on their stomach uh, is important. Uh, the other pieces, for some reason, and and I don't, I haven't. Seen the, anything that's been posted on why, but um, it seems to be a lot more uh, um, of a problem for women to uh, land correctly uh, in when when they jump and land. When, and it may be more to just the athletes I've had in here, but um, typically, uh, more often than not, when a, uh, one of our male soccer players jumps, they land properly. They sit their butt out, and they're in a in an athletic position. Their knees aren't going in. Um, but with a lot of our female uh, soccer players, when they come in, uh, when they when they land, everything shifts forward and their knees come in. And so 
usually their abductors are a little weaker and their glutes just don't fire right to uh, to have them sit back and and again I'm I'm I don't have the research in front of me or know why that is but I that's another thing that I've noticed and um, that's again the reason why we uh, incorporate the working on how to land properly in the weight room we do really heavy RDLs and hamstring work to really try compensating for the imbalance that they have um, obviously if you don't have a weight room then it's trying to figure out how you can do that in that dynamic world. All right, let's take one last question um, from Natasha, and I want to add a little extra to that. Um, she asked about are the warm-ups appropriate for other sports? Um, and um, certainly um, my addition to that um, is um, when do you start introducing the ball, and can the ball be part of the warm-up process so you add some specificity to the warm-up for soccer? Um, so uh, the first piece of it is, yes, it can be used for other sports. Um, and just really where uh, where the difference is in is in the planes of motion that they use and the different movements they have. So if you're, you know, working with a tennis player, they have a lot more lateral movement. So the dynamic warm-up is going to incorporate more lateral movement. Um, you know, uh, if um, in volleyball you're you're not doing um, you know you're you're not it's quick movements you're not doing a lot of there's no really running in volleyball so those type of things aren't going to be in the dynamic warm up but the overall you know what I presented today as far as the different goals um, we use those same goals in, in a very similar dynamic warm up for um, for volleyball for men's women's soccer for football. Um, we even use it for softball and baseball, but it's it's a lot more adjusted because they don't have all the, the multiple cuts and, and, and change of direction like you do in, in the other sports. But, yeah, we we utilize the dynamic warm-up uh, with these goals for all of our teams. Um, and then as far as what you were saying, as far as when do you incorporate a soccer ball, um, it, to me, if, if they have all the exercises down, they're doing them correctly, um, you know, then you can start looking at it. But if you... To me, uh, and this is me not being a, a sport coach, but being a strength coach. To me, my preference would be that you wouldn't. Um, but if you were and you you wanted to utilize it, to me it'd be making sure that in the start you're accomplishing the main goals through a few exercises, and then you know s switching your gears to to add, adding the ball in for for those drills and and knowing that when I add the ball in, my goal is no longer the you know the stability or or the um, the um, uh, range of motion, but my goal is more them using that stability in a soccer-specific drill. So I don't know if that answers it, but um, so it would be more making sure you have some, like, so if you're going to use a soccer ball with a stability exercises, make sure that you at least did one one exercise working on stability without the soccer ball. And then near the end of your dynamic warm-up, okay, now I'm going to add them stabilizing and balancing on one leg while a partner is passing them a ball. Thank you, Steve, for uh, 